I'm from Toronto. I was born there in Canada. I did my undergraduate at the Toronto, at the University of Toronto. I studied molecular biology and molecular genetics. That's what it was called then. I also did a major in math and a minor in Spanish, just sort of for fun. And at the end of undergrad, I'd become really interested in developmental genetics. So there was a geneticist in Spain whose work I was familiar with through undergrad who I was really interested in. So I called him, well, I wrote him a letter. Uh, he was in Spain, in Madrid, and that's who I worked with for my PhD. So I went to Madrid and did my PhD there in Drosophila genetics. And then by the end of my grad school, I'd become interested in evolution as well. Really, I was interested in understanding how development worked not only in one organism, the fruit fly, but how it worked in different organisms and what were the differences and similarities. So I looked for labs that took comparative approaches to development, and I did a postdoc, first a very brief postdoc in Crete, with a guy named Mikhail Saverov. And I began there to learn how to work with non-traditional model organisms. Then I did a longer postdoc in England, in Cambridge, uh, in the lab of a guy named Michael Aikam, who had been working with many different organisms for a long time, but also, like me, had a foundation in Drosophila genetics. So I was there for about six years, and then I moved here to Harvard in 2007 and started my own lab. I never wanted to be a scientist. I never wanted to be a researcher. I never wanted to be a professor. Um, I did not want to do those things. They just never occurred to me when I was a child. The, the only constant professional goal that I've ever had, the first one that I had and that was the one that I held on to for the longest was I wanted to be a musician, a professional musician. And um, so f until my late teens, I assumed that that's what I would be doing. And I was the music child, and that I was sort of the arts and humanities kids. You know, kids, at least in North America, get boxed into categories very, very early. And so because I could read early, and I had an affinity for music and writing, um, I was put into the humanities box very, very early. And I always did very well in those types of subjects. And I did okay in math and science, but nothing stellar, and that didn't bother anybody, it didn't bother me, it didn't bother my parents or teachers, but at the same time, no one ever encouraged me to try to do better. Say, well, why aren't you doing as well in math as you're doing in English, for example? And uh, so I continued like this, and then in the middle of high school, it was really, um, for some reason, there was a trigonometry exam in grade 10, so I would have been 15 or something, and I happened to do very well on that test, and most people in the class didn't do very well. And that was the first time that I'd really outperformed most of my peers in a math or science subject. And I kind of thought, oh, maybe, maybe I'm, I can also be a math person, like all the other math people in our class that I didn't think I was one of. And so I went to math class following that with just a different attitude about who I was in that classroom, which was I could be a math person just like that person. And I never got anything except an A in a math class after that. And I had something similar happen to me in science. I also hadn't been particularly or, you know, riveted by the science classes I had had since up until then. And we had a chemistry teacher when I was in 11th grade, so I was 16, and he was new to the school, so he didn't know any of us. He didn't know that Cassandra was the music girl and that Ian was the math boy. He just knew our names, barely, and that was it. He came in, and I happened to do, again, very well on the very first quiz in chemistry, which was just to memorize the periodic table, basically, and some properties there. And I happened to arrive early to class, which was also unusual for me. And he said, ah, oh, Cassandra, you're my star chemist. And I thought, what are you talking about? He said, oh, well, you clearly have an aptitude for chemistry. He said, and he wasn't being serious. Being able to memorize a periodic table doesn't mean you have an aptitude for chemistry. But he was just trying to be encouraging and try to get people to like chemistry because that was his job. He was a great teacher. But it made me think again, oh, maybe I could be a science person and also do science. And then I became, I changed my attitude, I guess, about who I was in that classroom, and that, I think, enabled me to learn a lot and to become very interested, and I did very well in my science classes. So then, at that stage, even though I had not focused on any science courses because I'd been planning on studying music at an advanced level, I then had to sort of rewind and catch up and study on my own during the summers the advanced classes in high school science so that I could do science in undergrad. So when I started undergrad, I was interested in I thought that I wanted to train to be a neurosurgeon. I was never interested in practicing surgery, but I wanted to learn how the brain worked because I thought it was a really interesting puzzle. And I thought that neuroscientists learned this, neurosurgeons rather learned this. And uh, now that I know neurosurgeons, I know that they don't understand how it works either. So I would never have learned that if I'd gone to medical school. But I entered undergrad as a pre-med and very quickly decided to move out of the pre-med track because most of my classmates in that program 
were not really interested in learning the material. They just wanted to get the highest grade possible at whatever cost to make sure that they got into the medical school of their choice. My goal was not to beat anybody at anything. My goal was to learn how the system worked. And so the environment in the pre-medical uh, system was really not attractive to me. So I switched out of that, which meant I had to choose a degree in something. And I had a friend who sang in the choir that I was singing in who said, oh, she was in the genetics program. It was pretty interesting. So I literally just ticked that box at random because I had to tick something because I was moving into my second year. And in my second year of undergrad, my first official year in this genetics program, I actually didn't think it was very interesting at all. We had molecular cell biology and organic chemistry, and it seemed like a huge amount of part list memorization. And I didn't see what the point was of learning all these names. I didn't understand what the problem was that we were trying to solve by memorizing all of these properties of different organelles. So I didn't very, pay much, very much attention to it. And I spent a lot of time in the math department and a lot of time doing music and was, kept myself interested that way. But in my third year of undergrad, when I took biochemistry, that was the first time that I saw biology as, it wasn't just a list of parts, it was a complex machine that we knew a little bit about how some of the parts interacted and really didn't understand how many of the other parts interacted. But we knew that the output was hugely complex and very variable. And that now, to me, became an interesting problem to solve. And I became interested in learning the tools to solve those problems. So I really only became interested in and aware of developmental genetics through the lens of biochemistry at the end of my undergraduate years. And by the time I finished undergraduate, I decided that I was interested enough in development as a problem and genetics as a, an approach to that problem to pursue graduate studies. Not because it hadn't become a career goal, but it had become something interesting enough that I thought I'd like to learn more, and I know that that's what graduate students do. And so I'll learn more about it for another five years and then see what happens. So I first went to the MBL in 2002 as a student of the embryology course. Um, and I came to that course, I had been made aware of the course when I was first started as a graduate student about five years earlier. And I knew about it because one of my fellow grad students from that lab had just come back from the course when I started in the fall. And he was raving about the course, it was so amazing. Because we were a lab that worked on wing development, I worked on germline development as a student, but no one had worked on embryonic development and this student needed to understand something about embryos to further his project. So he took this course, he came back, raved about it, I thought this sounds great, I want to take this course. And I said to my supervisor, I'd like to take the course. He said, you should definitely take the course, but not yet. You should wait until you're a senior graduate student, like Pedro was, and you will ne then know more, you'll have a better background, and you'll get more out of the course. I thought that was really unfair. I thought the course didn't say that it was only for senior graduate students. I wanted to go then. I thought I should learn now at the beginning. I thought he was just being mean. Uh, anyway, as with most things, I understand now he was right to suggest that because after taking the course as a student, I then went back and taught the course uh, as an instructor for about six years. and. Uh, it's, it was very clear to me, even as a student in that year, that the more background you come into the course with, the more you can take away from it. Because your background is a scaffold that you can then hang new knowledge on. And as a very young graduate student, you have very little scaffold. Your scaffold is a little scrambled. You don't really understand how it's put together. So new information that comes in, it's harder for it to stick to things that you already know. Any student will learn a tremendous amount from the course at no matter what stage of their development they are. But uh, I'm very glad that I went later and I had sort of forgotten about it by the time I started my postdoc and then Michael, my postdoc advisor, suggested in my first year, he said, you'd like to do a project that involves looking at many different organisms that you have no experience with. Maybe the embryology course would be a good idea. And I said, oh yes, that course, I remember now, it'd be great. So I applied and went and it was definitely a, a it was a sign, my scientific life was changed by that course. Well, I guess one thing that I didn't realize when I took the course, and it took me a couple of weeks being at the MBL as a student for the first time to realize it is, is uh, that the embryology course, in, in any case for developmental biology, the list of instructors and students of that course over the last hundred years almost reads like a who's who in developmental biology today. And I had no idea that that was what the course was like. I really didn't know anything about it when I applied. All I knew was that it was a course that took place in this location and you learned how to work with different types of embryos and how they developed, and that was my goal. I didn't research the long history of it or anything like that. I only found out about that when I was there. And somehow, someone obtained, when I was a student, a list of previous uh, students in the course. I don't know where this list came from. And it was amazing to me to see that 
ninety percent of the principal investigators who I knew as developmental biologists in Drosophila or in other organisms had been students at that course at some time or other, or, or instructors in the course. And so that was really, that was really striking. Well, I mean, the, the science is a great thing about Woods Hole, but of course, you know, at the end of our, I'm sure when we're on our deathbed, I'm not going to remember the greatest experiment I ever did. I'm going to remember the people that were the most special. So the people who, uh, it's the people who really stand out. So I remember my classmates very well. Some of them are very good friends, even now. Um, I had a classmate um, named Sveta. Maslakova, who was a Russian nemertine biologist. She was an expert in nemertine worms and their embryos, and she's still one of the world experts in these. I just saw her recently at a conference, actually, and Sveta was, uh, she made a great impression because she was incredibly knowledgeable about her subject. She was much more, in a sense, uh, intellectually professional than most of the rest of us were at similar career stages, late graduate student or early, um, early postdoc stages. She'd become specialized in something that not very many people knew very much about, but that had actually a very long and important history um, much earlier than most of us. And I think this gave her that, that maturity and insight. And Sveta was also memorable because she would fall asleep a lot. She was asleep a lot. We never saw her in lab very much. She was sleeping on the couch. But then she would come to seminars or these discussions and ask these amazing questions. And we always wondered, how did she absorb all this information when she was asleep? So she was, she was very memorable. Um, in the first year that I taught in 2003, it was a very interesting year um, for those of us in a certain field because there's a, there was a very important paper in the area of fly developmental genetics that was retracted that year. And the paper had uh, made a big impact at the time, published in a very high profile journal about the, me the mechanics of a certain signaling pathway in development. And the results had been retracted because it, been it had been discovered that they were falsified. And so uh, the PI of the lab that had produced the paper had discovered that the postdoc who was in charge of those uh, data, who was the first author on that important paper, had falsified um, some of the key experiments, which made the whole thing invalid. And so we discussed a lot in that year, in that class. Not, not, it was not a whole class discussion, but there were several of us who were close enough to the field that we were aware of this and the implications. And it led to a lot of interesting discussions that have been I guess formative for me up until now about um, about the ethics of science and about uh, none of us were in the lab where this had occurred. So what that really means is none of us actually knew all the details of what had happened. So we all only had small pieces of information, but it was something that did affect all of us directly or indirectly. And so we were trying to piece together what would have happened, what could have happened under this scenario, what would have and then also tr we tried to put ourselves in the shoes of the people who were directly involved. If you were the PI in that lab, what would you have done? Could you have prevented it? If so, how? Well, if you were the postdoc in that lab, what would you have done? What would, what would you have done differently? Um, and it just it brought home to me, b before I had my own lab, how important the reproducibility of data is how much of academic science relies on an honor system. So that was a very formative, I think, um, discussion that happened to take place at MBL because we had a constellation of people who had the personalities and were close enough to that particular topic um, to discuss it and to be interested in seriously talking about the implications of that for the field, but also for us as you know, aspiring academics. I think one of my fondest memories of the, of the MBL is the library. Um, and. Um, Having, I've always loved libraries since I was a child. They were a favorite place for me. Uh, my first job was in a library, and the MBL library was very special for me because I could read these original manuscripts and, and monographs by these scientists who I knew had performed their work in that place, and that was extremely exciting. I'd come from a postdoc at the University of Cambridge that had an outstanding library. I mean, it would be hard to beat that library again for the texts and the original uh, works and again many famous embryologists had worked at Cambridge and their work was there but to me all of this embryology that I was learning at Woods Hole was brand new and so I learned about it for the first time in the place where much of it had been done and I could read the, and touch the original manuscripts that had documented that work and that was a very special connection and I hope that if there's one thing that the MBL makes sure to maintain it is that library and its collections.
So, um, so in in the biological sciences in general, uh, in North America at least, I think women are now uh, almost a majority, or perhaps even slightly greater, in the biological sciences at the undergraduate level. When I was an undergraduate, I would say maybe there were about 30% of us who were women in my specialty within that life sciences uh, course, the molecular genetics specialty. And um, But it was very clear that as you move on in the professional training as a scientist, even now the number of women drops off sharply. And so um, one thing that I think was really formative that I didn't appreciate at the time was that my undergraduate senior thesis exper experience in the lab of this new guy, the first three people in his lab happened to all be women. There was myself, another undergraduate woman, and a technician who was a woman. And so my first sort of full-time lab immersion happened to be in an environment that was mainly women. And of course Mark was our advisor. And in the lab across the hall from us, the PI was also a man, but the four or five scientists in that lab also at that time happened to all be women. The chair of the department when I was there was a woman named Brenda Andrews, who's a yeast geneticist. Um, and so there were many very successful um, senior and sort of early career stage women scientists around. And again, I sort of took that for granted as an undergraduate. But when I moved to my graduate studies, um, I became aware of how different, of how special that environment was, how different it was. And it's never been replicated. I can't imagine ever seeing myself be in that situation again with so many other women scientists around. I also moved to probably the, the most stark contrast that I could possibly have had as a graduate student. So I was in the lab of um, this man, Antonio Garcia Bellido, who's an excellent mentor, as I've said, but who had only ever had male graduate students before. Um, and that was not by accident. Um, and so I arrived in the lab, and the lab was fairly large. It was about 15 people, 10 to 15 people. And just numerically, almost half the people in the lab were women. But what I didn't realize was that only technicians were women. And women were only ever technicians in that lab. And only the men were graduate students. And the scientific personnel of the lab had only ever been men, with one exception, that had been Antonio's wife, who he began his lab with. And she worked with him until she passed away, which was just before I entered the lab. And so I worked for my graduate studies in an environment where not only was I the only woman independent scientist in that lab, I was the only one in literally in living memory with the exception of the advisor's wife. And so there were a lot of uh, some hidden and some not so hidden hostilities and tensions surrounding the fact that not only was I a woman in this lab where women had not been before, I was a foreigner. And I was clearly visibly a foreigner. Even if I kept my mouth shut, there was no way that anyone could possibly mistake me for somebody from Spain. Um, and so that was a very different environment that I didn't expect or anticipate because I actually hadn't been there for an interview. I'd never even met Antonio. We just exchanged letters in the post. So that was very different. And then my time in England, um, in, in England, uh, I would say in Cambridge as here at Harvard, there are many, many uh, talented women scientists at the undergraduate level, let's say at least half. About a quarter of the graduate students are women, approximately. A lesser percentage of those are postdocs. And a very, very small percentage of faculty, tenured or untenured, are women. And the majority of women faculty are in the untenured ranks at Harvard and at any university, as far as I understand. So, um, so I think it has, it has never made me doubt whether I want to be in science, but I'm very aware of the facts. Those are just the facts. And then the question that people like to argue about is, well, why is that and how can it be changed? And there's no single answer to either of those questions. But denying that it is a fact, and uh, I think is very unhelpful. And I also don't believe that it is random. So I don't believe that it is by chance that there are a disproportionately tiny number of women in science at stable senior career levels. Um, uh, yeah, the, the proportion of human beings that are women is just too large compared to the proportion of senior scientists who are women for this to be an accident. And I firmly believe that entrenched systemic discrimination that operates in subtle ways at many, many, at every level of training is what contributes to this. And, uh, and because
it is systemic and widespread and at every level, it's very difficult to pinpoint a single solution. There is no single solution that will address this. It also becomes difficult because it means that we are all involved in this. If it happens at every level, all the time, we're all involved, which means it's a more difficult problem to solve than the ones we usually like because there's no single person that's to blame. There's no single system that's to blame and there's no single system uh, that, that can be changed in order to affect the larger change. And so that means we all kind of have to be involved in the solution. And those are the messiest and most complicated types of human solutions. And so it's an ongoing problem. I the biggest influence for me that the MBL's had on my career is uh, taking the embryology course. What it taught me was not only a lot of basic information about many, many different embryos, but it helped me lose my uh, it, it helped demystify the process of studying embryos, just obtaining embryos, working with them, handling them, um, and not being afraid to try different techniques on different embryos. And so I find that extremely useful, especially having come from a background of having worked with arguably the best established animal model organism, this fruit fly. Um, now I have no hesitation to pick up any, any bug or any spider or anything, and I have quite a bit of confidence that I'll be able to access its embryos, get inside them, figure out how their cells are moving, do all kinds of different techniques with them. Um, and in fact, we've used that type of approach um, in the work that we've done here. So we've done a lot of different types of techniques in the crickets that we study or the milkweed bugs or the spiders that people have worked with those organisms before, but they haven't always used the same techniques that we've used. So we've um, so, and taking the embryology course for me was a really big part of that because it enables me to say to my students, well, ideally we'd like to do an experiment like this, but that hasn't been done in the cricket. But I know that in zebrafish, they do something like this. What if we adapt this? I bet we could turn it into something that's useful for the cricket. And the embryology course was really where I was exposed to people thinking like that for the first time. Um, um, yeah, and that was extremely helpful. Yeah, so that really changed it really did change my scientific career because it made me not only uh, um, unafraid to try new things on different embryos, it actually made me aware of the variety and the diversity of embryology for the first time. I had realized late in my undergraduate career that I really loved developmental genetics and then I discovered sort of a second scientific love which was embryology and I discovered that at Woods Hole. So watching embryos develop in real time is an unparalleled experience that I experienced there for the first time. And so in those, in those ways they really changed my perspective um, on science, the things that I learned there and they've definitely had a huge influence on how I've decided to run my lab in these first few years.